On today's episode... Another exciting area are dark factories, where you could essentially turn the lights off and robots pretty much run the factory. On a small scale, this is already being done, but think of an extreme example and, and potentially maybe a scary one where you can have robots building robots with little or no human intervention. Welcome to the Active Share podcast that explores less obvious investing insights in a world that's always changing. I'm your host, Hugo Scott Gall. Today, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Global Research Analyst Andy Sitka and Monica Budin, to discuss the future of manufacturing in the next installment of our Convergence series, which examines five growth themes that are shaping the future of investing. Today's theme focuses on the technology that is making the factory digital, sensors, software, robots, and cobots in connectivity. Andy and Monica cover industrials. That's what we're going to be focusing on. I want to say welcome, hello, and thank you both for being here. Hello, good to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Not at all. So let's get started and talk about the future of manufacturing. So I'm going to ask you, Andy, you talk a lot, I hear you talk almost every day about the future of manufacturing. What do you mean? Yeah, so I think when you think about the future of manufacturing, there's a lot of really exciting things going on, and it really is all about automation. So not only do we think about this in terms of the physical automation? So thinking of kind of the classic robotics, the movement of of goods in in a factory or the production of goods, but also increasingly it's about digitalization of designs and workflows. So I'd like to use an example, think of the modern car, how it comes to market. So it's designed virtually, they simulate the performance of that product in a virtual environment. They even design and test test production facilities virtually before putting in the physical processes that are increasingly automated with more sophisticated automation techniques. And then even the validation of the physical product, comparing it back to the digital world is done as well. And the result is much better products for consumers. Again, sticking with the auto example, if you think about the quality of vehicles, we've all seen this over our lifetime, quite dramatic improvements. And I think something that touches us all quite closely is the improvements in safety. So if you look at 20 years ago, vehicle fatalities on a miles driven per basis have actually improved over 35% over that period. So a lot of that has to do with better quality products. There's also um, more safety features going into cars. But these are some examples of how automation in the future of manufacturing is evolving and, and benefiting all of us as consumers. So I guess the future is all about automation. But in a sense, certainly in my career in the investing industry, the future has always been about automation. So what, why especially now? What, why are we kind of diving so deep into this? Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. And there's kind of a confluence of factors that are that is leading to automation really becoming more prominent or more important as we move forward. I would just list out some of them, first being the need for productivity. So if you think about manufacturing and you look at the time series of data in terms of productivity gains that we've observed, there was a period of time for several decades where we clipped along at about 3 to 4% uh, productivity gains annually. Really, over the past decade, this has ground to a halt. So we've it's seen uh, an industry that has really become starved for productivity gains. At the same time, I think manufacturing has always been about efficiency, less waste, really, from the beginning. But there's been a shifting of, obviously, more emphasis in society on doing things in the most efficient manner. So thinking about limiting emissions and waste. So that's shifted the business case or the the priority of in terms of some of these automation projects. So it's productivity gains. It's trying to do it with less waste. And then also we have a social element or a workforce element where if we look at the U.S. alone, there's some estimates that over the next decade we're going to be short. 2 million manufacturing jobs. So there's labor shortages. And this is because the industry is naturally growing, but also there's a a grain in the workforce and and we're going to need to replace these workers in this aging workforce. And we're just not doing it fast enough. So you're going to actually need automation to to pick up and carry some of that, that work, uh, that work burden. And then also you have a case where a lot of these solutions that are coming to market or that are present now when we think about bigger automation solutions. So thinking more beyond just the physical automation and some of these digital aspects are now proven and delivering very clear benefits for customers. So we think about 
use cases and that are really revolve around software like production monitoring, um, predictive maintenance, and and those delivering significant value. I think the predictive maintenance is one that holds particular promise because if you think about the downtime for a factory in terms of the cost, it, it's very high in some cases, millions of dollars per hour. And to be able to have better uptime is something that clearly is the delivering value for customers. So it's it's sort of a combination of all those factors, I think, coming together to drive demand for these solutions. So what I'm hearing from you there is that this is more than just incremental innovation. We're talking about something bigger. So I, Monica, I want to ask you, if we are saying we're in, you hear different people say different things, but let's say Industry 4.0, go back in time, I don't think they ever called it Industry 1.0. But if we say it's Industry 4.0 now, do you agree with that? And is this really the future of manufacturing? Is this really a a step change, as Andy said, there's a confluence of things. Are we really talking about a meaningful, let's say it's a step change, a meaningful change in the way that stuff is made? Is that too dramatic a statement? No, I think you're absolutely right. We think Industry 4.0 absolutely has the potential to unlock the step change in, in productivity. Many are calling this the fourth industrial revolution, and, and we're really seeing adoption picking up with manufacturing software investment growing three to four times faster than capacity. Unlike physical automation, which is already quite mature in terms of technology, digital automation maturity varies quite a bit by end industry, with relatively high adoption rates in areas like autos, but still quite low in heavy industry like oil and gas or construction. So the key to Industry 4.0 is bridging that gap between the physical and digital worlds, and that's done through the use of digital twins. In the simplest form, a digital twin is a virtual model of a physical asset. In practice, digital twins can be used throughout the life cycle of an asset from design through all the way through post-production monitoring. So sensors are used to capture data from an asset and feed it back into the virtual world. Their optimization can be simulated and fed back into the physical world, creating a continuous feedback loop. An example of this is uh, a sensor that picks up a deterioration of a part in an assembly plant, for example. That information flows into the digital twin, which can assess the severity of the problem, and maintenance can be deployed at a convenient time without disrupting production. So uh, that's a fairly simple example, but digital twins can be applied on a much larger scale. Think entire production facilities with digital twins, where the entire operation is in a constant optimization feedback loop. All of this results in greater efficiency, shorter production cycles, improved quality, and overall better asset lifecycle management. So Monica, what does this all mean for business models? What does the successful industrial company of the future look, look like versus the past? What are the areas that we think are most attractive as you slot into business models? Is it going to be around, um, well, more and more, is it going to be software driven? Yeah, we think there's definitely an opportunity for new business models. We refer to these as X as a service, where companies can really exploit all of the data that they're capturing, and they can offer new services such as data analytics, customization, and enhanced aftermarket offerings. That last example is particularly important in industrial companies, where aftermarket is often a significant component of the profits. In an extreme example, like a razor razor blade model, like we see in with airplane engines, for example, as much as 75% of the lifetime value of an asset can come from aftermarket. So what Industry 4.0 does is it enhances the value proposition the service providers can offer such as predictive maintenance, remote monitoring, or guaranteed uptime. These new types of service models can be especially appealing in industries where downtime can be extremely costly, just as an an example Andy mentioned earlier. So think of the loss of production output in a manufacturing plant where a production line had to stop due to part failure, or even just the disruption, something as simple as an elevator failure causes in a commercial building during rush hour. These new models can help address these challenges and minimize the impact to operations. So we think this creates an opportunity for both an expanded and customized aftermarket offering, depending on customers' needs. However, we should note that this is not an unmitigated positive for the service providers, as more data and connectivity can lead to more efficiency and eventually to a deflationary market. I think what I'm hearing there, and tell me if you disagree, is that switching costs are going to go up. Customers are going to be more tightly bound to to makers because the relationship, this is already obviously happening, but the relationship becomes dynamic and enduring versus a moment in time. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, if uh, you know, if the service operator can provide a kind of not 24/7 monitoring for the customer, that's a very appealing business proposition, and and it kind of ensures that the relationship uh, remains for the duration of the life cycle of the asset, and not just uh, you know until the point of sale. 
I think just add a bit, it's, it's really an opportunity and a threat. So the, on the opportunity side, it's the ability to be embedded even more into the, the, the customer in terms of now I'm, I'm selling them more of a service. I have a product. I'm guaranteeing that it's going to be available. You're going to have uptime. So the best companies will harness this opportunity and the use of data to, to deliver greater value for the customer, new solutions, better solutions. Whereas there will be some, though, that are at risk and don't kind of utilize this opportunity to, to get closer to the customer. So I think what we're talking about here is now if I'm running a factory and I have a automation component or something in the factory, let's use the example of a compressor, and there's data coming off that compressor. And now the maintenance intervals are now determined by more predictive analytics rather than just prescribed maintenance intervals. So you could see a scenario where the companies who don't come with those new solutions, who don't innovate in the right way and really meet customer needs, because at the end of the day is what it's all about, are at risk from, as Monica mentioned, deflationary environment or just, frankly, less parts going into these machines because now instead of replacing it every however many cycles or however many hours, you're replacing it when you need the part because you have insight into when that part is going to fail. So it is a bit of a an opportunity and a threat. We're optimistic that the best companies in the world will actually find ways to deliver greater value, expand the share of wallet with these customers because of that. But I think it's important that we're cognizant that companies can be complacent of this and it can be a threat as well. So a lot going on there. And as Monica laid out, these aftermarket streams are incredibly lucrative, very important to the business model. So something that's going to be really important to watch in the future um, as this plays out. If software is so important, does that therefore mean that manufacturing hardware is commoditized? Because that that is a change versus history of the broad high-level statement. Yeah, I, I think this is quite a big misconception and particularly probably formed by our, our consumer experience with technology where things have become commoditized in a lot of cases pretty quickly. Hardware used in industrial applications is, is much different. This is highly sophisticated, highly specialized, a lot of IP, not only in the, the product itself, but in the production processes. So these are products that are very hard to reverse engineer, play a critical role in many cases in the processes of manufacturers. So high levels of precision are often a differentiator. And the reason why these hardware companies or these industrial automation companies that are more hardware centric tend to have quite strong levels of profitability, really quite impressive. So I think that's quite a misconception just versus a consumer setting where you do see disruption happen faster. And also keep in mind that in a manufacturing setting, you tend to have a lot of inertia in, in, in the sense that there's not as much risk taking. So you have proven processes that work. So if there is a new offering that comes along, a competitor, these things tend to be designed in and there's some hesitancy to try something that's not as proven. So I think hardware being commoditized, we're definitely not seeing that. It does have some variance across the different products. That's obviously the higher the IP in the product, the less commoditized risk we see or risk of commoditization. But I think it's much different than consumer facing goods. And also, I would say hardware is critical when we think about automation. So a lot of attention gets paid to software that's opening up new solutions and rightfully so. It's very exciting. So it, that attention is warranted. But these are really the building blocks, These hard, the hardware that we're talking about here in terms of automation. These are the arms and legs of a factory, very important. So just as automation grows, these products will continue to grow. And obviously, there's incremental innovation as well that prevents it from becoming commoditized. So I think we are not seeing that really as a, as a trend, and it's very important in terms of automation solutions. So let's get a bit more specific on automation, because most people who think thematically or even, dare I say, write thematic research all say automation. You, you struggle to find someone who says automation isn't a thing, and, and they think it's overstated and actually it's a, about to enter a bear market in terms of growth. So everyone likes automation, but how do you think about, Andy, how do you think about winners and losers in automation? Yeah, I, I think that's a very important question, something we think about all the time. I think in the case of the companies who are supplying automation solutions, the good news is there's going to be more winners than losers because these are big markets. They're growing. And again, back to what we were just talking about, difficult to disrupt 
particularly for the incumbents. If you do think about where the tech companies are coming at this opportunity from, they recognize that they see the new solutions that are being driven by software. They're coming at it primarily from the enterprise level, where the more traditional automation suppliers, they've grown up on the factory floor. They've been embedded in the processes. They have a lot of domain knowledge. So they're coming at it from a different direction. Again, as we talked about, the disruption is likely to be much slower. Again, industrial processes are complex. They've been optimized over many years. There's that high risk of failure. So that inertia is there when it comes to slowing the adoption of new technologies. So I think the industrial incumbents are in a good spot. But I do think what we are seeing is to deliver the full solution, you have to have the integration of hardware and software. The automation companies, again, that have really come up on the factory floor or in where they live, are adding more software to their to their hardware to create solutions, deliver more values for companies. Whereas again, the technology companies, which are coming from more of the enterprise level, are generally partnering with the industrial automation companies to, to bring fuller, more robust solutions to customers. So I think there's kind of a, it, it's going to be a, a happy future where a lot of these companies can coexist together because the opportunities are so big. There's so many niches. Uh, there's so many companies with strong competitive positions, and the solutions are delivering value for customers, and that's driving growth in the industry. So I see disruption being a being less than people expect, and there being a lot of opportunity for for many players in the industry. Okay, so it's just occurred to me that not one of us have yet said robots, and we've got to say robots. We've got to talk about robots, and so where where should we look for automation growth? And please talk about robots. <laughs> Yeah, robots are probably, I, I would say, in our coverage, robots and airplanes are, are probably some of the, the most favorite topics of, of me and my colleagues. And you're absolutely right. Robotics is a very significant area of growth. And you can take it in a lot of different kind of directions here. But I think if you think about the classic manufacturing setting, discrete manufacturing, so assembly of an auto or a car, that is more along the maturity curve in terms of robotics penetration. They were really the early adopters of that kind of automation technology. But still, if you think about emerging markets, there is a lot of growth even there from penetration in, in robots and factories. But probably more exciting on the robotics front is moving into new applications, new markets. And again, this is all about the innovation that allows you to get there. So thinking about warehouses, so picking goods in a fulfillment facility has been very labor intensive until recently you couldn't use robotics. But now with the innovation we've seen in Vision, which is a very key building block that increases flexibility for machines because now you can see your environment, you can react to it. Combine that with robotics, you can now pick and pack with automation. So you're seeing quite a bit of growth in logistics in terms of automation and on the robotics side, again, with that Vision component. And then I think if you think further out, a massive opportunity, something that we're really just scratching the surface on is robotics in the service industry. We know service jobs, there's tens of millions of them in the U.S. alone. These are not the most exciting jobs a lot of times. So robotics, particularly what we call collaborative robots, so these are robots that humans can work next to, have a lot of dexterity, there's no safety cage can be used to automate some of these service jobs. So this is really important and will be a big growth driver for robotics for many decades to come here. And if you think about, again, the, the need for it, we're going to have labor shortages in a lot of these service jobs. Again, they're not the most exciting jobs, so good for automation. So I think that's where you're going to see a lot of growth in, in robotics in the future. I would also say, you know, we've talked about it quite a bit, but that industrial software piece, particularly around digital twins of everything. So assets, factories, products, the ability to simulate, optimize, have those feedback loops, that's going to be an area of, of growth as well. But it really is vision, robotics, and industrial software is, is the areas that we're most excited about. Okay, time for my favorite question of this series we've been doing around convergence, which is the moonshot question. But I guess a little bit within the moonshot question is, is all the things we just talked about, what does it mean for people? Are, are all of us going to see the benefits of this accruing to us in our everyday lives? So that's really two questions that, that maybe that probably are connected. So I'm, I'm really interested in the kind of moonshots, but I am interested in the effects of what were moonshots but are now actual things. I can start here. Um, 
so we actually see a lot of exciting opportunities in the consumer space. Not only will product quality improve, but a lot of these applications that we've talked about already are trickling down into consumer products. So take the heart rate monitor as an example. It is essentially the first step towards a human digital twin. Next, Andy's already talked about the service industry opportunity a bit, but that can also be expanded to use cases in the home. Think of a robot that can do the dishes or that clean the, can clean the bathroom. Um, another exciting area are dark factories where you could essentially turn the lights off and robots pretty much run the factory. On a small scale, this is already being done, but think of an extreme example and, and potentially maybe a scary one where you can have robots building robots with little or no human intervention. And kind of the last moonshot I'll, I'll put out there is autonomous vehicles. This could really be a game changer. The technology for wide customer adoption is probably uh, still years away, but we see a lot of potential for robo-taxis being widely deployed within our lifetimes. So, yeah, I'll just add, I, I agree. The future is, is really bright for society here. And it can be a bit easy to get carried away dreaming about what the possibilities are. But I do think manufacturing, the automation in manufacturing is going to lead to uh, better outcomes in our daily lives on the services front. And even if, as Monica mentioned, in a domestic setting, you think about robots doing dishes, for example. So you can dream of a scenario where the housework's done by a robot, your car drives itself, and we all know how much time we waste in traffic. So that time is given back to us. And we all enjoy the benefits of safer, higher quality products that are made with a lighter environmental impact. Who doesn't want that, right? And then you think about the professional side, and I think the robotics and, and I guess automation more broadly gets somewhat of a, it's a meaningful discussion, but maybe on the negative side is people focusing a lot on what happens with job displacement. And yes, there will be job displacement, but as we've talked about quite a bit already, there's a lot of shortages in these industries. And the jobs that are being replaced, I think, are important to think about too. So these are typically dull, dirty, and sometimes even dangerous jobs that are being automated. So we're going to be able to, as a society and professionals, redeploy those workers in the workforce into knowledge jobs that are more enjoyable and should, as a society, lead to greater innovation. So very important for, for growth for all of us in a broader sense. So I think it's going to be really, truly exciting to watch how it unfolds. We're at this unique area where there's a lot of innovation, and it'll be exciting to see how it all plays out over the next couple of decades and, and exactly what the potential is. But we see a lot of benefits to to people and society at large from, from these technologies. That is a very uh, good and encouraging way to finish, I think, lots of change and lots of positive benefits from it broadly to society and then also obviously for the companies who are well positioned and as Monica said, described the business models of the future. So look, I just want to say thank you to you both. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Monica, for, for joining me. This is the last in our convergence series and it was a very good, upbeat and uh, exciting way, including robots, to finish. So thank you both. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to today's episode of The Active Share. To hear additional insights from William Blair Investment Management, visit us at blog.williamblair.com. The Active Share is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and TuneIn. For questions, comments, or topics you'd like to hear discussed, email us at podcastim at williamblair.com. This content is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any security or to adopt any investment strategy. Investment advice and recommendations can be provided only after careful consideration of investors' objectives, guidelines, and restrictions. The views and opinions expressed are those of the speakers as of the date of this recording, are subject to change without notice as economic and market conditions dictate, and may not reflect the views and opinions of other investment teams within William Blair Investment Management. Factual information has been obtained from sources we believe to be reliable, but its accuracy, completeness, or interpretation cannot be guaranteed. Any discussion of particular topics is not meant to be comprehensive and may be subject to change. This material may include forecasts, estimates, outlooks, projections, and other forward-looking statements. Due to a variety of factors, actual events may differ significantly from those presented. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. Any investment or strategy mentioned herein may not be suitable for every investor. References to specific companies are for illustrative purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any security. 
William Blair Investment Management may or may not own any securities of the companies referenced. It should not be assumed that any investment in the companies referenced was or will be profitable.